people of Denver, I give you the governor of the Roman province of Judea. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I, uh, I appreciate the, the respect. Um, you may be seated. My name is uh, Pontius Pilatus. I come from a very influential family in central Italy. In case you're wondering, you're wondering, how did you get here today? Don't worry about it. Capiche? Pontius was a common family name in Italy 2,000 years ago. Pilatus means armed with a, a spear or bald. I prefer the first definition, and I have uh, killed people for suggesting the second. I'm a military man. I love the arena the gladiator games. In the games, the truth is the last man standing, if you know what I mean. 26 AD, I was appointed to my post by Caesar Tiberius himself. I am what you call a friend of Caesar's. My post was that of governor of the Roman province of Judea. Provinces that were deemed peaceful were governed by the Senate. Provinces that were deemed trouble were governed by men like yours truly. And Judea was trouble. But Judea was of strategic interest to the empire, it was in the Middle East. I hope you realize that your country and the Roman Empire have very much in, in common. Whether you rule with guns or money, you are an empire. Your motto, e pluribus unum, that's Latin, Roman if you don't understand that. It means of many, one. Your government is based on Roman law. Your national symbol is our national symbol, a bird of prey, P-R-E-Y, not P-R-A-Y, the, the eagle. I'm saying that out of all the characters in the Bible, I am most familiar to you Americans. Pontius Pilatus, the governor, the president of Roman Judea. Now let me say that over the years, I have received what you call um, some bad press. You know, people, people say that the death of Jesus, people say that the death of Jesus is my fault. Well, no, that depends on what the meaning of is, is. <laughs> and I did not have sexual relations with that woman. So maybe a little historical perspectivity is in order now. 63 B.C. Rome had occupied Judea for our intelligence had unequivocally indicated that the Jews had a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> a WMD. Take a look at this irrefutable surveillance map. The Jews kept the WMD in, in a massive stone bunker, which they referred to as the temple. In the inner chamber of that temple, which they referred to as the sanctuary. 
Historical documentation uh, clearly uh, indicates that uh, it was uh, more powerful than a million billion nuclear warheads. They referred to the WMD itself as the Ark of the Covenant. And so we launched Operation Desert Infinite Enduring Justice Maximum Freedom. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Upon occasion, some have doubted my integrity. And so I present to you this document, my certificate of live birth, <laughs> unaltered or tampered with in any way. Now, people have said to me, you Romans cannot rule the world. And to that I say, yes, we can. Yes, 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 we can. Okay, okay. <laughs> this, this, I, I can tell you, this I can tell you. With me, with me, it's winning, 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 winning. There'll be so much winning, you'll be tired of winning. I don't even know for sure what we're winning, but you'll be winning, winning. I'm your favorite president. You all know this. More, more famous, more popular, more popular than Caesar or Lincoln. I'm, I'm so popular. Everybody says so. Everybody says so. More popular than, than well, Jesus. Jesus was popular, but I'm popular. Maybe the most uh, popular. Make Jerusalem great again. MJGA. Come on, man. Come on, I got just, I got just got two things, two things. Number one, number one, them Jews messed it up. They messed things up bad. They messed it up. You trust me, I'm your Uncle Joe. Number one, they messed it up. But number two, we had a plan. There's some real deep state stuff. We were going to level the place. Not one stone left on top of another. And then number two, number, th number three, then we build back better. <laughs> we, we build back better. <laughs> Ciao. It's a Pontius Pilatus again. <laughs> and I, I'm messing with you. I, I know it stresses you out. I know it stresses you out. I am aware of this. Have a guest speaker uh, talking about your presidents at a, at a time like this. I, I'm, I'm just saying that out of all the characters in the Bible, I am the one that is most familiar to you Americans. And this is my judgment. This is the way I see it, or at least that I, I used to see it. The, the last man standing is the truth. Power is what's best in life. This is the good. Conan, what is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of your women. That is good. That is good. He would make a great governor, don't you think? Yeah. And I, I was a great governor. Capiche, I, I had a way of enforcing my will. I, I was known for mixing the blood of the Galileans with the blood of sacrifice, if you get my drift. Soon after I was installed, I trapped hundreds of Jews in the arena in uh, Caesarea, and I demanded that they honor the emperor. And you know what they did? They all bared their necks and said, we have no king but God. They said that a lot. No king but God. I could have made them talk. We Romans have our way of making people talk. I wasn't scared of them. But I, 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 uh, I was scared of Caesar. Like I said, we had a way of making people talk. The, the cat of nine tails was one way. Um, we could make people talk with one of these, of course, without the flowers and the drapery. Um, 
But with this, I thought that I could break the spirit of any man. So I thought I could make the Jews relent that day. And, and like I said, I wasn't scared of them, but I was scared of Caesar because Caesar had installed me to keep peace in the Roman province of Judea. So that day I, I relented and I figured that the Jews, that they were as tough as they were because, you see, they were more scared of their Lord than they were scared of Caesar. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I figured that if the Lord existed, his glory must be that he could kick Caesar's ass, instant, Caesar's assistant. <laughs> but I figured that he didn't exist because we were doing all the kicking and we were not the kickies. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. <laughs> yeah, right. Our truth was marching on. We was the last man standing because we'd made every other man fall. We Romans had conquered the world. But, but granted... We had some trouble conquering one heart. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. But you see, the judgment seat belonged to me. And I had never called retreat, and I was never planning on calling retreat. I... I was determined to never, ever abandon my post. And that's what I look for in a man. A man that will never abandon his post. And that's why I, Pontius Pilatus, am here this morning. Not to talk about me, but to talk about the man who would not abandon his post. It was Friday of Passover week. Hundreds of thousands of Jews had journeyed to Jerusalem for the feast. I had taken up residence in the praetorium just to the north of the temple where we could keep an eye, you know, on all those crazy Jews. I hated the Passover. The Kidron Valley literally became a river of lamb's blood. It gave me the willies. You know, our Roman gods, they were just like regular Roman people, only jacked up on like supernatural steroids or something. But the Hebrew God, strange. Not, uh, not like anyone. And to me, if he existed, he was the very definition of bloodthirsty. They thought that the blood atoned for the sins of the people at the judgment seat in the heart of that stone temple. Well, it was early one particular morning during the feast that, that a mob led by the chief priests, led by the chief priests, came to the praetorium. They would not enter the praetorium for fear that I would defile them. And yet they threw a man at my feet who had obviously been defiled. They claimed he was an insurgent. They were all insurgents. They claimed that he wanted to be king. They all wanted to be king. They were jealous. I had heard remarkable things about this man. Only five days before, thousands had showed up to worship him. And now, he could barely stand for, for all the beaten. I called the man into the praetorium and I said, are, are you, you, the king of the Jews? And suddenly, he, he looked up, and his eyes, those eyes, they like, they locked on me. His eyes locked on me as if he knew me. And then, as if he cared about my answer more than anything in all the world, he asked me a question. I'd asked him a question. He asked me a question. He said, do you say this, Pilatus, of your own accord, or do others say it to you about me? Who do you say that I am? Pilatus, that shook me. I tried to give a mocking answer, but I think it betrayed a little bit of sincerity. 
am I a Jew? In other words, are you my king? Am I a Jew? <sighs> now look, um, I'm just going to read from your Bible, okay? Because actually, I think it's fairly accurate. All right, this is John 18, verse 35. So Pilate, I, 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 uh, I answered down down in uh, verse 35. I answered, I answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have, what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then I said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. <laughs> he said that with such authority. But I hadn't said that out loud. I don't know, maybe I, part of me, maybe part of me wanted to say it out loud. Maybe he knew that one day I, I would say it out loud. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Well, he must have been listening to his voice just a little bit, because then I said to him, what is truth? Now, I said that with some disdain because a Roman praetor makes his own truth. But I think a part of me maybe said it in hope. And yet I, I knew, even as I said it, that he couldn't really answer. We all must answer questions like, what is true? But how could you ever answer the question, what is truth? How could you ever prove that truth is true? How could you ever prove that reason is reasonable? How could you ever prove that the logos is logical or that beauty is beautiful? You just recognize it or you don't. You don't make your own truth. You surrender to truth. Or you go insane. My question was the most foolish and confusing question a man could ask. It's like asking a person standing right in front of you, do you exist? How do you trust the answer? Do you exist? What is truth? And he just looked at me as if to say, Pilatus, you know me. You recognize me. I am the truth. I said, what is truth? Because he was beginning to cut me in half. If I let him go and he led a rebellion and even was accused of leading a rebellion, Caesar could have me crucified. So I wanted to save myself from the truth. But another part of me... <laughs> wanted to be saved from insanity by surrendering to the truth. So what do I do? <laughs> Suddenly, I had an idea. Maybe I could save myself from the truth by condemning somebody else. <laughs> and so I held the very first democratic election in all of history, at least in biblical history, okay? Anyway, John, 1838b. After I had said this, I went back outside to the Jews, and I told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out. They voted. We did this several times. They voted again. Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber, a criminal. Barabbas was like me, just less organized. <laughs> he was like me, he's like you, easy, easy to blame. So you see, I thought if I could blame Barabbas, condemn Barabbas, maybe they'd ease up on this Jesus fellow. So I asked him several times. Well, I did, my, this happens to me a lot. My wife sent me this message. I had a dream, Pilatus, have nothing to do with this righteous man. Have nothing to do with this righteous man. The righteous man wouldn't leave me alone. I was having everything to do to me. I couldn't shake him. I was getting desperate. I was becoming terrified. 
John 19, 1. Then I took Jesus and flogged him. That's the cat of nine tails. That's the 40 lashes less one because 40 lashes could kill a man. That's the way we break a man's spirit. That's the way you make someone bad if they ain't being bad. You see, if uh, we can only find the fault in them, it, like, excuses the fault in us. Capiche? You understand that? And so the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, verse 2, and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Does it make sense to you that I did that? Of course it does. You do that. Before you kill a man, you have to make him as bad as you can, at least in your own mind. You have to make him as bad as you can, or the truth will cut you deeper than you can bear. And I was being cut. For he would not return evil for evil. When he was reviled, he wouldn't revile in return. We'd struck him on one cheek and he'd just uh, turn the other. When he was hated, he would be, do nothing, nothing, nothing but love. And it was relentless. He would not abandon his post. When he was threatened, he did not fear. And that, that really began to terrify me. He was undivided. His will was absolutely free of me. His will was free, but I was not free. He was undivided, but I was being divided to the division of soul and spirit. Verse 4, I went out again and said to the crowd, See, I'm bringing him out to you guys, that, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. I said to them, Behold the man. I was pleading, look at the guy, look at the man. Behold the man. I thought this is what man, Adam, is supposed to be. Truth in love, undivided. But I understood their hatred. The revelation of who he is is also the revelation of who we are not. Apart from a miracle. <laughs> Verse 5, I said to them, behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. I said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him because I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered me, we have a law and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When I heard that statement, I was even more afraid. I entered my headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave me no answer. How could he? In truth, he's not from anywhere. For he is the creator of everywhere. And every wind. He's the word of God. So I said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered me with the utmost compassion. You, Pilatus, would have no authority, no power over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has a greater sin. From then on, I sought to release Jesus, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar's. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when I heard these words, I brought Jesus out and I sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of the preparation of the Passover, and Jesus is the Passover, the slaughtered lamb. Capiche? It was about the sixth hour, sixth hour of the day, sixth day of the week, sixth day of creation, 666, I, I said to the Jews, behold your king. You, see, I did call him king, didn't I? They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. I said to them, shall I crucify your king? 
the chief priest, get this, the religious guys, the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. So I, Pontius Pilatus, delivered Jesus over to them to be crucified. I tried to save my life and lost it. I judged him. And he, like, wouldn't judge me. And that, somehow, is the judgment. I judged him, but in truth, I was being judged by the judgment of God. This is the judgment. The light. The light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light. He's the light, and I chose darkness. I judge the truth. I judge the love. I judge the judgment of God. So the moment that I pronounced judgment, I was judged. It's like the part of me that longed, that longed to be saved, you know? The faith, the hope, the love in me was suddenly like imprisoned in that part of me that longed to save myself. My ego, my pride, my anger, my, my, my shame, my craving, my own private hell. <sighs> you know, people have said all sorts of things about me. There's a legend that my body was disposed of in this dark lake on the side of Mount Pilatus in the Alps. And that every Good Friday, you can still see my ghost hovering above the lake, frantically washing my hands, trying to rid myself of the blood of Christ. And that could be true. When you reject the truth, you necessarily go insane. According to Eusebius, the third century historian, I committed suicide in 39 AD after being called back to Rome by the emperor. That could be true. When you reject love, you necessarily trap yourself in death because it's love that binds all things together in this communion called life. So yeah, that, that could be true. At least, at least, at least for a time. But I was trapped by death long before that day that my, my body died. I was trapped by death the moment that I rejected the way, the truth, and the life. The moment that I rejected the love standing right in front of me. According to Tertullian, the second century theologian, I came to faith before my body died. <laughs> and that could be true. It could also be true that I came to faith after my body died, like all the saints in the Old Testament. Faith is the death of death. The second death, which is eternal life. And Jesus said, this is the commandment of the Father. I know what it is. It's eternal life. That means faith is the judgment of God. So, because he had no judgment of God, which is good judgment, because he had no judgment of God, because he had no faith in the word, Adam took fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden, and he suffered the judgment of God. But there was seed in the fruit. And the judgment of God is not finished until the judgment of God, who is the seed, cries from the tree in the middle of the garden, Father, forgive them. It is finished. <laughs> My judgment was to take his life. His judgment is to give his life. My judgment was to take his blood. His judgment is to give his own blood. I was the bloodthirsty one. My judgment is to demand sacrifice. His judgment is to be sacrifice. My judgment was disobedience. His judgment is always mercy. My judgment was fear, and his judgment is relentless faith, hope, and love. I judged everyone. 
and he judged no one. <laughs> and that is the judgment of God. That day I stood before absolute truth, relentless love, and eternal judgment. And I, Pontius Pilatus, tried to change them all. I tried to change them all. I tried to change him, but he is the one that changes me. He is truth and love, the judgment of God. Grace and the judgment of God is stronger than the judgment of Pontius Pilatus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Your Bible says a little else about me, me in particular. John 19, you'll read how I was one of the, who, uh, you know, I was the one that insisted that they put the sign on the post where, where Jesus hung, king of the Jews. See, I did say that he was king of the Jews. Mark 15, 43, you'll read how Joseph of Arimathea, he asked me for the body of Jesus, and I gave it to him. Subsequent, uh, after summoning the, the centurion, that centurion who along with his men crucified uh, Jesus, I'll never forget the wonder in that fellow's face that, that even haunted me all of my days. Matthew 27, you'll read how at the prompting of the Jews, I posted a guard, four to 16 soldiers, you know, and posted, put a Roman seal on the tomb so that no one would steal the body. And of course, you know how the angels appeared and the gods dropped like flies. And then Jesus appeared, standing again and again and again. And again, and again, and again. You know, your word resurrection translates the Greek word anastasis from two other Greek words, ana, meaning in the midst, and stasis or stasis, meaning standing. The resurrection is the revelation of the last man standing. He's the last man standing because... God the Father is able to make him stand. You know, as soon as you expire, <gasps> God is more than able to inspire <sighs> you. He made you from dust and breath in the beginning. I mean, why couldn't he do it again? And so, hundreds and hundreds of millions of men, and now I'm old school, so when I say men, you know women, I mean men, women too, right? Anyway, so hundreds and hundreds of millions of men, they uh, expired, and then God inspired one man, Jesus, effectively saying, behold the man, behold the finished man, What humanity truly is, the image and likeness of me. So the last man standing is also the first man standing. The eschatos Adam. To be honest, I didn't need all them Easter stories to know that the last man standing was Jesus. I mean, that afternoon, when the sky grew black and Jerusalem began to shake, I mean, it felt like the entire world was giving birth. I expected, I expected him to be standing, and I saw him standing in the eyes of that centurion that Friday evening as he stood before me. I mean, normally a centurion like that, he, especially after a day like that, would be utterly terrified in my presence, but he was not at all terrified of me. Because he was in absolute awe of Jesus, for he would not abandon his post. See, normally when you, when you flog a man, and then you nail him naked to a post, that man will beg for mercy and comply with anything that you tell him to do. Or... He will revile you and rail at you with the most intense hatred. But Jesus, he refused to abandon his post. He wouldn't comply and he would not curse. He could have called down a legion of angels, but instead he cried, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't know good from evil, said Jesus hanging on a tree in the middle of that garden on Calvary. Father, forgive them. Who's them? A 
but it's at least me. I condemned him. I judged him. And he would not judge me, which is the judgment. He is the judgment upon all my judgments, <laughs> all my arrogance, all, all my flesh. Revelation 19, with the sword from his mouth, he cuts the flesh from the kings of the earth and every man. Read it. Revelation 21, the kings of the earth. You know who that is? That's Pilate, that's Caesar, that's Herod. That's all those guys I was making fun of at the start of this message. They all bring their glory into the new Jerusalem. His robes are drenched in, in, in blood. From the winepress of the fear of the wrath of God, the winepress is his cross, for there he tramples the grapes of wrath, making wine, that's blood, and blood, that's wine. He transforms vessels of wrath into vessels of mercy, his own blood vessels. He said, Father, forgive, and then the sky grew black, the earth shook, and he prayed Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, he descended into hell, my hell, and your hell. Psalm 22, 29 keeps going. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. I went down to the dust, and he came for me. He comes for all, and from the darkest, deepest dungeon, he calls to his Father in, in faith, with faith. I, I can't tell you how long I was in hell. But I'm telling you, you don't have to go there at all. If only you would surrender to his judgment. Last verse of Psalm 22. He has done it. He's done it. It's finished. His judgment is in hell. My judgment is hell. The measure you give, Pilatus, is the measure you get for a time. But time itself comes to an end, and he is the end revealed at the seventh trumpet. So he lifted his head, he cried, it is finished, and he <sighs> expired. He delivered up his spirit. It was his spirit that fell on the church at Pentecost. It was his spirit that animated that centurion on that good Friday evening. And I think it had even been his spirit that hoped in the truth in me, even when I pretended not to know the truth, his spirit imprisoned deep within my ego, my arrogance, my fear, my shame, my prison of death. I now see why I was so terrified that good Friday so long ago. I was beginning to recognize him. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Mine eyes had seen the glory for he would not abandon his post. He would not change. He would not become like me or Caiaphas or Caesar or Conan. If you're waiting for him to change, you won't recognize him when he comes. Jesus Christ sent him crucified as the last man standing. Behold the man. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. This is good news. Our God is marching, <coughs> march, marching on. He cried, it is finished, delivered up his spirit. And the curtain in the temple separating the Ark of the Covenant, you know, which is the judgment seat of God. So separating the judgment of God from this age of men and all the judgments of men, it ripped from top to bottom. And what was in, got out. And what was out, got in. The tombs in Jerusalem, around, around Jerusalem, they, they were opened. And, and the saints came out of the tombs and entered the city. It's in your Bible. Go read it. Sorry, I'm, I'm yelling. Told myself I wouldn't do that. But you see, the judgment of God is the WMD. 
is the weapon of mass destruction. But only because it's also the WMC, the weapon of mass construction, the weapon of mass creation. The judgment of God destroys your old man and liberates the new man from deep, deep down inside of you, like a well rising up within you. You see, you are the temple of the living God. You are the body of Christ, who is the last man standing. By the 5th century AD, the empire was nominally Christian, as is yours, but the greed, the lust, the dishonesty, the violence continued. The gladiator games continued until one day this little Syrian monk, he wandered into Rome and then to the Colosseum. He had felt led there. And when the games began, he understood why he had been led there. Gladiators entered the, the arena and they saluted the emperor and shouted, glory to Caesar, we die to the glory of Caesar. As, as the game started, uh, Telemachus, this little monk, he jumped up on the perimeter wall and he began crying out, in the name of Christ, stop. But nobody paid him no mind. He looked like a clown. And so then he jumped down off the perimeter wall. He ran out into the arena between two huge gladiators and he just called out, in the name of Christ, stop. One of the gladiators took his shield and just flung him like a rag doll, you know, across the arena floor. The crowd cheered and they laughed. But Telemachus wouldn't stop. He, he ran back in front of one of the, the gladiators uh, as the crowd is uh, yelling and, and laughing, and, and he blocked his blow. And at that, the crowd became annoyed, and, and they began to chant, run him through, run him through, run him through. Telemachus was standing in front of a, a huge gladiator who was Pilatus, means armed with a spear. And so he took his pilus, and as the crowd is chanting, run him through, run him through, he, he thrust it into the heart of Telemachus. A hush fell over the Colosseum as Telemachus crumpled to the dust. The blood poured out of that little monk like wine out of a broken vessel. It was grace out of God's vessel, God's blood vessel. And with his dying breath, he, he swung the sword. He cried out, in the name of Christ, stop. The Colosseum was entirely silent by this point. They all sat staring at body broken and bloodshed. And then one man stood up, another man stood up, and another man stood up, and then the emperor stood up. And then as one man with one will, one free will, they all left the Colosseum. History reveals that that gladiator contest was the last gladiator contest ever held in the Roman Colosseum. Perhaps the empire. And you see, that means that Telemachus was the last gladiator. And all those people in the Colosseum was the last man standing. In the end, there's only one man standing. And that man is the last man and the first man, the eschatos Adam. And we are his body, the body of Christ. E pluribus unum. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam, the eschatos Adam, became a life-giving spirit. 
15.22, as in Adam, all die, so in Christ we'll all be made alive, Ephesians 1. This is the plan for the fullness of time, to unite under one head, anakephaliao, one head, all things in him, Colossians 1, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And I hope you know that this is how the body of Christ changes the world. Not by electing men like me. As I uh, said to you, Pastor, with your constant anxiety over men like me, you just testify that you do not trust the resurrection and the life. The last man standing. You know he stands before you every day like he stood before me. Truth, love, mercy. And when you surrender to him, you become truth, love, and mercy in flesh. And then you stand before men like me as the judgment of God. And you wield weapons far more powerful than any nuclear warhead. You are the temple of the living God, and in the depths of your temple is the Ark of the Covenant, the judgment seat of God. Truth and love, the grace of God, who is God. You are the WMD, and you are the WMC. And you are the WMR, his weapon of mass resurrection. Capiche? You know, the devil, he's not worried about your elections. But trust me, the new me, he is absolutely terrified of you. when you are honest. Even though the entire world is dishonest. When you love, even though you feel like nobody loves you. When you forgive. Even if you think to yourself, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they, they don't know. What, they, of course they don't know what they're doing. When you are faithful, although the entire world is unfaithful, when you pray, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, the devil is terrified. For then you are the last man standing. The anastasis, the resurrection and the life, the judgment of God, the image and the likeness of God in flesh. For on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And in the same manner, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, This is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. Behold the man. Now pray with me. You can just um, say these words silently in, in your heart after me. But just say, just pray with an Italian accent or without, doesn't matter. <laughs> Lord, I surrender me to you. And I receive you into me. Live your life in me, King Jesus. I want you to be my governor. <laughs> Amen.
So we invite you to come forward. There'll be three stations. You can tear off a piece of the bread or take one of the little bread cubes. There are these little cups of juice if you're worried about this. But if you're not, then take that piece of bread and you can dip it in the cup. The brown cup is wine. The blue cup is juice. Uh, they're both the judgment of God. <laughs> take that bread and that wine and ingest the judgment of God, the last man standing, the resurrection, and the life. And so, Lord Jesus, we praise you, and we thank you that those praises will never, will never fail throughout eternity. Lord, with what I know of this world, oh, it is absolutely the very best news that you are king. And so we thank you, we praise you, we surrender ourselves to you, and we say, Lord Jesus, live in us, govern us, for your glory, for you are the good, and you are the life. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. And now um, I need to say that that was me the whole time, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I know it's shocking. Gosh, I really feel naked for some reason. But, but I... Uh, I just want to thank you so much for um, coming, and once you know, you're always welcome to come back. Uh, we do this every week, actually, so um, it'd be great. It'd be really great to see you. But as you leave today, may you believe the gospel. It's just incredibly good news. The WMD is the WMC, which is also the WMR, which is you. So may you leave today with courage because he has conquered and his judgment is final. And now you know it's good. Oh, I should say this too. One of my secret service agents is on the prayer team, right? Ted, are you going to be down front here? If you'd like to pray with someone, uh, look for a scary guy in sunglasses down front here and he'll pray with you. Have a great Easter. Um, Amen.